Welcome to the October 17th uh, Town Council workshop on the Public Safety Building. Uh, and we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I think Councillor Babine is going to be a little late. Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to Kevin Freeman, who is the chair of the committee, uh, who will give us uh, the report. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, uh, Councilor Donovan, and, and thank you uh, for uh, meeting with us tonight to discuss the public safety building. Uh, we've got members of our committee are, are behind me, and Mason Rall from uh, Landry French, our construction manager, is in the audience, uh, and Tom Perkins, our owner's representative here for the town, is with us along with the chiefs and me. Um, <clears throat> when I came here on August 15th, to give an update, <clears throat> we had just got pricing back from our um, our bid process, and we were in the uh, Landry French and the team were in the process of, of kind of doing the post bid analysis. We knew we were over, <clears throat> but um, we knew that there was a process in place to try to get there. At the same time, when we came here on the fifteenth, we had just had indications the Friday before that we had kind of got a sign off at the Department of Environmental Protection, part of the multi-step process, but a critical part, the, the stormwater part. And um, <clears throat> since that time, we've been working to get the project within budget, and we still do not have mm -hmm. a DEP permit. And it's had impacts on our project. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to go over tonight, to, to give you an update of just where we're sitting. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tom Perkins uh, to explain the details of it all. I'm going to throw him under the bus. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, again, thanks for your time. And, you know, we felt that uh, we, we've been working really hard for the last two months since we met with you to, to, uh, to work these numbers down. And uh, as you have, if you've had a chance to look at the advanced reading material, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of stuff out here beyond... Our control is a, as a community that's uh, kind of working against us, but we've, we've come a long ways to mitigate that. Um, to kind of talk about this in terms of timeline and again to, to, to talk about the cost thing and DEP permitting, those are really the, the two things that are keeping us from starting the project today. Um, so we filed our DEP permits back in, in April. They said it's probably a three to five month process. Um, and at the same time, we had some preliminary estimating done on the site plans, and lo and behold, the first indicator of what's going on with the markets is the site plan cost came up about half a million dollars high, four to five hundred thousand dollars high. So we design, made accommodations in the design to re reduce that cost uh, by 425000 uh, We moved on to June and July, and we felt very good based on the DEP permitting submission and the response and that we had gone through all of the preliminary steps that they wanted and seemed to be a favorable thing with a three to five month window. We said, let's put together some early work packages. So if we get that permit in three months, um, we're ready to go. So we put together the site work and the civil, um, uh, engineer, civil engineering portions of the work, uh, as well as the shop drawing pieces for structural steel and uh, for um, reinforced concrete and we got those out on the streets for a competitive bid and what we, we discovered through that process is we had some unexpected cost escalations in the concrete and the steel and that we again went back to the design through a collaborative effort with our team and, and accommodated for those cost overruns and we, we found a way to save another half a million dollars. So we're ready to go with the site work piece. We're ready to go with the concrete and steel. Those guys are, are getting ready. We know who those contractors are gonna be. We kind of talked about that in August when we met with you. Same time in August, all our designs came to fruition. All the packages were completed, went out on the street for bid. And then as Kevin said, we got that partial, the, the critical stormwater piece, by the way, yeah, I'm all set. I signed off on your projects. So we really felt like, project was going to start sometime in August or September. We, frankly, we geared up for it. Um, as Kevin said, in August and September, the rest of the disciplines and the bidding came in. And this time, our unexpected cost escalations were in the HVAC items, the plumbing, and the electrical items. 
So what we've been working on since we met with you is uh, by looking at uh, different ways, swooping out systems, and we'll go through that in a little bit of detail in just a minute. We've, we've peeled out another $1.5 million to try to get this back in budget. The building <coughs> hasn't gotten any smaller. The programming is there. Uh, but we've really, we've, we've frankly cut to the bone as best we can to maintain the integrity of the project. So where that leaves us here in October as we sit before you is we're still about 420,000 short. Or it's about 2% of the project, to put it in perspective, of the total project budget. We do, however, have $500,000 in a contingency still that, in a sense, could offset that completely, but it really <coughs> is not a smart idea to start a $20 million project without any kind of contingency. Uh, it's just not a, not a smart move. We have received our fire uh, marshals, state fire marshals permit, so that piece is good to go. Um, DEP, we keep um, pinging them through various uh, outlets, and they let us know that we're in the queue, and just as a total sort of cost reductions to date is, is about 2.4 million that we've worked together as a team through the CM at risk process with our team collaborators with, uh, with uh, uh, our design firm and Landry French to, to pare this down and get this down close to budget. Um, why is this thing over budget? Well, it's two main things, the tariffs not that it's the direct, you know, steel went up X dollars, X percentage things. It's this bandwagon that seems to be out there. And if, you, it, and again, we submitted some stuff that Landry French was nice to put together and, and, and provide for context to you uh, of what's happening in the market right now with material prices. And this is nationwide. So just because, you know, steel may go up, but now the toilet's suddenly $20 more per for a fixture for some reason because everything's jumping up. And that's sort of a nationwide problem that's affecting our project. The other piece is really local to southern Maine and especially southern Maine, but Maine statewide, and that's labor. Overall, there's a labor shortage. After the recession, most of the uh, construction companies uh, contracted as far as workforce. And as the, and the, as, as the economy has built up, they haven't really added those people back in that used to be there. And then the other thing working against us, 2018 is an absolute bull market for construction. And uh, there's uh, other projects. I was just speaking with the University of Maine, who's a fantastic client to have. They've got bid packages that they've advertised and put out, and nobody is even bidding on them. No responses. Uh, so those are the challenges that we're, we're facing. Um, just to kind of talk a little bit about exactly what we've changed in the building, uh, architectural finishes, we've, we've reduced the types of floorings, uh, wall material changes, um, millwork material changes, and just overall sort of grade reductions. We're trying to, not to be callous, but just trying to stay in that Chevy range, but maybe we're in the LS range and not the LT package right now, but we're still got a good uh, Chevy. Uh, on the facade of the building, we've changed out the, the metal products, uh, different types of metal products that are less expensive, but the same look. Um, we spent a lot of time this summer approving some masonry mock-ups, and ultimately there was a very uh, attractive cost reduction to do, go to a brick that is uh, a little more actually similar to the brick that's on this building that we're in now. So uh, we've taken that, uh, we've made those changes. Uh, probably the biggest change on the project is the HVAC system. Uh, we've reported on a, a chilled beam system was what the building committee was uh, presented with and, and recommendation, which is a very good high efficiency system. Uh, what we've uh, gone to uh, is a uh, water sourced heat pump system, which is similarly uh, energy efficient um, and reliable and, and not a new technology. And most importantly, um, for our purposes of tonight's <coughs> discussion, it's, it's with, within the budget that we are able to reach. And then off of the contractor furnished materials into the, and the stuff that we as a town are going to buy, the furnitures, fixtures, and equipment. Um, we've deferred purchases of equipment. We've kind of put it on a wish list. Those things are like the uh, uh, air compressor uh, for the uh, um, 
uh, bottle fill, the washer extractor for the fire department gear. Um, these things we have space for, we'll have the utilities for. If there's money left at the end of the project through that contingency, then we can make a decision on, we may be able to go buy those pieces later on. But right now, to try to get these numbers to balance, we, we really had to make some tough decisions and say, no, we're gonna, we're gonna defer that purchase that's gonna be out of the project for now. Um, and we're gonna relocate more of the equipment that's considerably used now in the Curtin Public Safety Building and bring it into the new one. Um, so for mapping a path forward, and I'd like to open it up just for a kind of an open discussion, I'm really happy we're able to do this in a workshop setting, is there's really two, two things that we need to do. We've, we've got to close the gap on the budget to get started. Um, there's three ways we've identified to do that. We can somehow secure some other revenue sources, in a sense, increase the budget. Um, we can remove some critical items from the scope and programming beyond what we already have. And this would be sort of, uh, not sort of, but this would be in effect kind of now we've, we're making that cut into things that we really <coughs> felt we had to have as critical parts of the project. Now we're going to have those uh, deferred as well. And some of them aren't able to be added back later on. Um, and then the third option that we've exercised is, is our due diligence in managing this uh, situation is um, do we make the building smaller? And we looked at the building and that smaller section would be uh, on the first floor, the, the maintenance wash bay, and then the museum and future expansion bay on the opposite side of it. Directly above it would be two dorm rooms and a shower room. And then on the outside would be the building and the ground storage room and the public toilet. So we need to close the budget shortfall. And then, as we've been discussing, we, got need, we need that DEP permit. <clears throat> I don't know why it isn't here, what it takes to get it, but um, we have those two things and we can start making this public safety building a reality. You know, <clears throat> before opening it up um, to you, had we not gone with the construction management delivery method, Hmm. We would have been sitting with $2 million, a, a project that was $2 million over budget and no way out. Um, this process that we've employed with Context Architecture and their design team and um, Landry French uh, as the construction manager has been extremely collaborative. And we've just been identifying, we've been trying not to touch the program and just really touching all materials, you know, going to, you know, considering linoleum when we have to. Um, consider, you know, we've, we've even gone as far to say, well, we, what if we don't fit out certain portions of the building that are more for future use? Um, but we hit a point where we think that it's, we're hitting penny wise, pound foolish type items. And, you know, when you look at, like, if we were to explore doing this reduction of the, of the building, well, that's not just chopping off a building. You've got to redesign it. Right. And um, so, um, but we, we are really thankful that we've gone with the delivery method that we've gone with and the production that we've got from our project team to, to work together. And, and it's just, this has been a, it's, 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 it's not glamorous. It's an iterative process that we just keep working at on a weekly basis. When we first considered coming in here to speak with you, we were at about $650,000. And just in a couple of weeks' time, through great ideas, uh, we were able to cut it down to 230. We think we're at that point where we really can't get much more out without touching the, touching the, uh, the program. So. Good. Uh Councilors want to ask questions, and uh, uh, I'll be ready to start, but I'll defer to anyone who would like to begin. Yeah, so More comments. Go ahead, Will. Thank you. So um, just so I'm trying to get my, my head around it, so the, um, the, the total that a cost escalation was around $2.4 million, is that, that correct? And we've been able to work through about $2 million of, of that, and so we're still short now about 400000 <laughs> so it was the, the things on the previous slide that were the, the got us to the $2 million mm -hmm. cost reduction. Isn't it closer to $3 million? It's close, yeah. It's closer to $3 million in total. They've taken so out right. two point four, and there's a ma remaining four twenty five or so. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Go 
Go ahead. To, to just a point of clarity, I think you said you got it down about 235, but the prior slide said 430. So what is what is the, the gap we're looking it, for? It's right 420. As 420. 420. 420. Yeah. And, and a question for the town manager. Tom, mm -hmm. you just said something to us saying we got an unexpected sort of windfall for salt shed or something, yes. which is what, 127,000? 124. 124,000. Yeah, there's that, actually three things that I'd like to bring to your attention that were unexpected in this current year. First of which you mentioned, this is the reimbursement from a town investment back in 1999, believe it or not, for replacement of our salt shed. And the state of Maine just got around miraculously to our great <laughs> surprise, uh, reimbursing us uh, this just two weeks ago. So that's 124. Uh, also, we had sold town property that this council has approved. There's about $41,000 in proceeds there that was not expected in the budget. And lastly, uh, due to the Chief Thurlow's efforts, uh, we're looking at a reimbursement for our costs for the October 2017 storm, from, uh, reimbursement for FEMA in the order of $75,000. That again was, we've incurred those expenses, uh, this revenue was not expected. So those alone are $240,000 in revenue in the current fiscal year that we did not anticipate. Uh, a final point I'd make, and I wish I'd made it clear to the Finance Committee last night, as regards, um, uh, the question was around fund balance, mm -hmm. and uh, with respect to the excise tax, that continues to be the juggernaut. Mm -hmm. In FY18, those books are closed and an audit is underway. But we are $504,000 over estimate um, on excise alone. Now, there's many other things that will shake out in the final audit. But I bring that up just by way of giving you some confidence that um, my estimation is that we'll end comfortably um, for FY18. I don't think we're cutting into fund balance. So I just throw that out there, not saying that we need, and not suggesting we should rely on that. But that's uh, actual to budget. I can say that with, with great certainty. I, what I can't say is that what the other factors that will affect FY18 uh, year end. Yeah, we, that was a question we asked last night, but we didn't seem to get a definitive answer. You didn't. But, you didn't. Right. So, I, and I'm not here giving it to you. I'm just saying that that piece is an actual. We, we know what we budget. That's positive. We, absolutely. But, but there are some others that may have gone. We don't know yet about. Right, and, yeah, and okay. for that reason, I wouldn't necessarily say bank yeah. on it, but yeah. there's a, some positive indicators there. Jean Marie. Um, I, these are just my thoughts. I was going to ask about that salt money, yeah. but you beat me to it. That's, that's fine. Um, <laughs> the, um, the reason feds are raising rates right now, as we all know, is because of inflationary pressures, and obviously this is part of that, because I certainly see that in my business. Um, I, I, I'm very frustrated that the DEP has not given the permit to us, but we're in an election year, and I know they were already short-staffed, mm -hmm. and people are already, they're leaving in droves right now and going wherever, but that's not to excuse them either. It really ticks me off that um, they're costing us money and all <clears throat> for all intents and purposes. That being said, I really hope we can come up with this money because I... It's just going to be more expensive in the future to do what we've got planned now for all of the reasons that uh, Kevin uh, relayed to us, as well as, you know, money gets more expensive in the future unless we have a horrible, horrible recession or turn back, which hopefully isn't going to happen anytime soon. So I, I personally don't want to see us reducing the size of the building or, or cutting back on that because that's kind of, to me, cutting off your nose to spite your face because all I can think of is the middle school building, for example. As soon as that was built, it was too small. Um, so, and then when you've got uh, Scarborough Downs coming along and other building going on, I just hope, I would like to see us looking at these other revenue sources rather than cutting the building or... Would it be helpful? Uh, we've identified eight items to reduce <clears throat> further, kind of into the bone. Would it be helpful to see for you to see those and we could speak to why we're hesitant to put them up? Uh, is, is it in the nature of a recommendation or is it Not. a laundry list from which you're looking for the town council to give you guidance? Sure. Because I'm, I'm wondering whether or not you actually <clears throat> have a recommendation as to the 
Those, those, those items do not come by way of recommendation, but we felt we'd be remiss not to have done the work to say if we had to do this, what would it look like? And uh, these folks can speak more definitively to the challenges that each and every one of those items presents. Hmm. Peter. Yeah, I think from my perspective, I think it would be helpful to know to see what types of choices we're really facing. So it does lead us one direction. I think it would also be helpful for the community to understand <clears throat> what types of things. I mean, I think you guys have done an incredible job of going from where you were to this. Right. My guess is when you give us those items, it's going to make it very real about what we're really talking about. And at this point, if we just did this quick math, we're only about $200,000 oh, yeah. short, okay. which, which oh, yeah. in the scheme of where we are, that's not a whole lot of money. So. Well, so I, I still have, so I'd also like to, to see the list just again to get a to get a sense yeah. of what those choices those hard choices are that we're, we're faced with. Um, but my two questions are, what are the so we, we had put this out to um, to vote. Was that only for the amount of the bond, or was that for the amount of the product? Like what what is our ability uh, to to use other sources of revenue to um, shore up the project? We had a project uh, estimate of just over twenty one point five million dollars. Uh, we went to the voters and secured authority to borrow up to 19.5. Uh, the other sources are uh, was existing reserve funds that we had in hand, and the proceeds of the sale of the building, which has not occurred. Um, that's a point worth raising. Mm. Uh, there's <coughs> certainly the potential of selling it for more than was necessary to close this gap, but I don't have that number, and I don't sit here with confidence uh, saying that we can count on that. But I think that's a piece that will... Uh, emerge over the coming months. But, it, but it's within our authority to identify other sources of information other than just those listed to say we're going to put those toward the, toward the project. Sure, it's within the council's authority to use other resources uh, if you wish. Okay. Uh, and then my other question was, what, what is the time frame under which um, the, you know, these expenses are going to be outlaid? I mean, is it, is it something where it's over the next 36 months, or is this money that we would have to, you know, write the check? Mm -hmm. It, it, once you know the shovels hit the hit the ground, it's approximately an eighteen month project. Once we start, <clears throat> I will note that um, as as the team has been going through the uh, the value engineering process, we've had to pick up the cost of the delays right. of the DEP permit right. because we're now having to carry winter conditions <coughs> that, that we would not be carrying right. had we started back in August. So it was an impact that you know there is a cost to that. And that's, and that's in the $2.8 million that we talked about, that escalation. Yeah. If I could, though, there is a near-term issue. Um, the way that this relationship works is that we'll be presented with a guaranteed maximum price by the builder, by Landry French. Uh, I'd be the one that executes that. I'm essentially committing to the fact that uh, committing monies that I don't have in hand. Um, so there's a near-term issue that's going to be coming forward, I, I would like to think, within weeks, certainly within months. So the project will extend over 18 months. Gotcha. I, I guess my question was, if we if we were to think about putting something in the budget for next year, that would be potentially something we could do. Certainly. It could. And certainly between now and then, there's mm -hmm. some other pieces that will fall in place. Sale of the building, uh, I certainly expect before budget time. Uh, we don't know the extent of it, but we do fully expect to apply for efficiency main rebates based on uh, mechanical systems and the like. So there'll be additional pro, you know, proceeds coming back. We, again, we don't have a dollar figure for that, but all of that will become clear in the coming months. So it sounds like uh, we have several sources, potential sources mm -hmm. of, of revenue uh, funds. Uh, an alternative to that is to reduce the size of the building by what is proposed here is 2,300 square feet. Uh, that the decision as to sources of funds could be any number of uh, uh, ways to pay for it, uh, and we wouldn't necessarily have to settle on a particular one tonight. No. Again, my concern is I'm going to be confronted sooner than later with uh, the need to sign this guaranteed maximum price right. and therefore commit funds. And we wanted to have this conversation before I was put in that predicament. And just to add to the, the urgency of that decision and that process is the fact that as these delays have continued to go on, we've lost contractors already. We've lost some of the low oh, bidders, yeah. which has also implicated mm -hmm. 
you know, mm -hmm. has caused price mm -hmm. increases. So part of signing that document, entering into that formal agreement with Landry French, also allows them to subsequently contract with the subs and the low bidders that we are working with now and securing that workforce so that the minute we get the permit, we can start the project. And Chief, uh, is the linchpin issue there the DEP permit? It as, opposed to, as opposed to the funding shortfall. <laughs> Well, it's a little, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, we have to have the permit before we can start, right, but right. we also need to be able to, Tom needs to be able to sign that guaranteed maximum pricing, which means th that he needs to have some assurance that we're going to be able to right. to do that. And, and, in, and before, Landry French can't lock in the subs until right. Tom has signed that we're going to actually pay the bill in the end. Yes. And so that's where we're losing. And you do remember what was mentioned at the outset. We do have, and we've kept it fully intact, a $500,000 contingency. We didn't offer that up as even an option because you think right. that would be reckless to start right. a project of this magnitude with no give. Um, right. I think the council probably would like to see the eight uh, uh, options. If you want to present that, I think that would assist in the discussion. Will. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. So if it is a guaranteed maximum cost contract, what what would then be dipped into for the contingency? Why would we still need the, the half million or? Uh, we, the biggest risk is coming out of the ground. We know we have ledge. Uh, we did do a lot of due diligence to make sure that we uh, accounted for as much as we can. But at the end of the day, it's underground. We don't know what's there. There's an excessive quantity there. We may be on the hook to pay for that. Um, there may there's just a million things that could come up during the course of the construction that um, that we need to have some funds set aside to pay for. That would not be uh, something that could be reasonably inferred by the construction manager that they should have been responsible for. Mm -hmm. I will say that, in, and again, construction management at risk is a fully transparent process. As we've seen what they're carrying for a contingency, which is effectively the first pot that gets hit before the owner's contingency gets hit. Mm -hmm. And it's it's substantial as well. So, um, and the nice thing about it is we get to the end of the project and we don't use that, then that money comes back to the town of Scarborough as mm -hmm. unused funds. And that could be used for some of these things we're deferring. But for what we know right now, and having lived through a few construction projects like this, of this size, uh, we are at the bare minimum of what we should enter the project with for contingencies, but I'm comfortable with what we have that it'll be a successful. Part of that comfort from comes from the scrutiny through this value engineering. This design and building has been scrubbed and looked at so many times. Undoubtedly, there'll be some surprises, but I think that process gives us a more and more comfort just that uh, we've looked at every possible angle. And, and last week, just to give you an idea, because so many of these subcontractors who are offering tremendous cost-saving uh, you know, methods and, and, and uh, possibilities of changing systems, and they're really putting themselves out to try to get this project. They don't have a contract to be working with us yet. Yeah. And uh, last week, we, we went over and toured an office building in South Portland that employs the, the water source heat pump system. Yeah. And you know it was the contractor that was leading us, and uh, we met with the facilities manager of the, of the, uh, it was Wex. Uh, we met with them. We <coughs> got an evaluation of their system. We toured it in similar size office space that we're going to have in the building, and and they really signed off on it. But but those ideas were a collaboration of of Mason and his team at Landry French going to the subcontractor saying, is there a better way? And what we've, what we've done is we've been able to bring that HVAC system, you know, within our budget now. And, but that, that company is doing that at their risk. They're not under contract yet. You want to go through the eight? Sure. So we have, uh, through our uh, planning for the project and uh, best practices of other uh, fire stations with million dollar and probably soon to be multi-million dollar pieces of apparatus, um, they highly recommend that um, the radiant floor system be put into the concrete slab to dry the bottoms of the vehicles so that it preserves them longer. Uh, goes hand in hand, frankly, with our wash bay, maintenance bay next door to it so that the bottom of the trucks can get blasted with <coughs> all the salt and um, debris that comes off of them that tends to rot these frames. So uh, again, cannot be 
added back later on, but if we've got to cut something, then, then that's something we've added to the list. The sum of these eight things approximately equates to the 420,000 that we're short. Um, there's an exterior canopy that needs to cover the emergency <coughs> response vehicles that are not otherwise parked inside the building. Um, this keeps vehicles from idling during icy weather conditions so that the windshields frost up. It keeps them clear and free of snow. Um, nobody wants to hear that some kid died because it took uh, an extra 30 seconds for somebody to get somewhere in an emergency situation. And it also provides cover to the canine area um, <clears throat> for sun shading. Um, our communication tower, which we've talked about with planning board, um, is uh, because of, uh, for a few different reasons, but we want to be compliant with the town's ordinance to uh, co-locate on communications towers. Uh, we've uh, increased the size of it to um, accommodate future cell phone carriers. And everyone that's even got a whisper or rumor of this that came out with the RFP that we put out is chomping at the bit to right. try to buy some space on that tower, which would be a future revenue stream for the town. None of those numbers are figured into anything we're talking about. But at the end of the day, we could make that tower very similar in size to the one we have here and reduce costs and, um, and make it smaller and only useful for communication of public safety needs. Um, there's a campus sign that's been in the program uh, from day one. Um, and uh, the current campus sign that's in front of this building uh, is in need of repair. Um, we actually have been thinking about reusing the digital sign board that was recently donated to the public safety building and incorporating that. There's some money there to make that happen. Uh, that would be cut. Um, for the fire department dormitory, we've got 14 dorm rooms designed to accommodate the full future expansion of uh, the, well, the immediate uh, or the uh, near future needs of the fire department. Um, beyond that, the building is structurally designed to accommodate additions on the top if they need more than that. But um, what we looked at is, okay, day one, Chief Thurlow, what do you have to have for dorm rooms? Well, I have to have 10. So what we did is let's look at what it would take just to not do any finishes, any lights, any heating, just bare bones, nothing at all in four of those dorm rooms and what would those cost savings be? Um, we had budgeted to bring over some dispatch consoles. Right now there's um, five that are in place now. Our current plan allows for six. Um, we have a few of them, uh, a couple of them of the five that are pretty new that we were going to kind of try to buy new matching ones to go over there and replace some of the ones that are a little bit older and outdated, uh, sit stand capability, all of that. Um, so we've, in this scenario, to make this up, we would be remove, we would be relocating all of the dispatch consoles and reusing those in the new space. Uh, similar to the dorm rooms, the lockers in the police locker room uh, asked um, Chief Bolton, okay, what do you have to have on day one for, for lockers versus what we've got planned for future? And we've taken that reduction in quantity because um, uh, police department gear lockers are a fairly expensive item given all the stuff, and the, the wiring that's in it, security that's in it for lockup and um, that was that quantity. And then we even went so far as to look at the new training room, which is sized to handle uh, 100 people. And it's really more of a community room as much as it is a training room for public safety. Uh, you've priced furniture lately. It costs a lot of money to put 100 chairs and tables into a space. So we looked at, well, maybe we plan for that, add on to it, and we'll relocate the current training room furniture over to that space and, and make do with that. Uh, but at least we have the space, we have the finishes, and we have the room, and we have the programming, and we have all the building that we want, um, and we can get this stuff later, and, and we still have a decent building. And you, have you priced what that represents? It's approximately the 420000 We We had to come up with a list of things that could close the gap if we had to. Uh, we obviously they listed the things 
we have 220,000 that we've identified as funds that were not accounted for in the budget. We have uh, reserve funds. And we now have a sense of where we are in terms of cutting to the bone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to ask each of you to give your opinion as to where you sense the appropriate direction would be uh, to resolve this problem, and give guidance to the committee and to the two chiefs and the construction manager. I'd like to start. Peter. Yeah, I guess I'd be in the place of suggesting that we use the funds that were identified, the 230, um, and then to Will's suggestion or others that we move forward, authorize the town manager to execute the contract, and the remaining balance that we need of the 200-ish, we find a way that it either comes out of when we get final numbers for the mm -hmm. close out of 18, if there's some positive Sure. We can we can make a decision to allocate some of those reserves to this yeah, that project. Yeah, will be in our hands in December, so we'll we'll have some clarity sooner than later. And if there's not money there, then my recommendation would be that we work it into the budget, mm -hmm. some manner, shape, or form, that comes before us that we deliberate for next year. So yeah. I would I would I think they've done a great job of getting to where they are. I think at this point, some of those things we could probably do, but but for two hundred thousand dollars, I think it. it we, we should move forward as quickly as we can. Councilor mm -hmm. Rowan. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that some of the things on that list are not, you know, delaying the, the training of furniture. Well, that would be too bad. We could do it. But um, I, I agree. Let's see where we, where we end uh, fiscal year 18, 18 and then look at mm -hmm. fiscal year 20 for, for the remainder. But let's go ahead and sign the contract. Okay. Councilor Caterina. I agree. <laughs> Thank with you. Both. Yeah, I, I would agree uh, with those recommendations, but I would also want us to keep an eye on the possibility of um, that future revenue stream with the communication tower as a way to oh, yeah. fill backfill right. any holes and, and have it be very specific to whatever we were to draw from, we replenish. Yeah, on that, we, we appreciate there's some sensitivity around cell towers and such, mm -hmm. uh, in spite of the fact that we've got an ordinance that <laughs> encourages co-location, just appreciating that there is likely there should be a process around uh, whether we should do that and how many and so on and so forth. So that's something we could undertake sooner than later. Uh, we just wanted to preserve the option for that conversation to be had. Mm -hmm. I think as between uh, further cuts, uh, based on the several million dollars that you've already cut out of this budget, um, or finding funding means in the $200,000 range, I would much prefer finding funding resources yeah. within our budget uh, or other sources. Uh, and so I think you probably have heard a unanimous viewpoint that we would like to see the town manager go ahead and sign the guaranteed maximum price contract. Uh, uh, and. Uh, use the monies, uh, the 224000 has been identified, uh, uh, and look to find a balance. Uh, I do expect you will have more surprises. So oh, yeah. this is probably not our last conversation on this, but we'll work together uh, to try and uh, resolve it because sometimes things will break in our favor, uh, just as the excise tax has. So, Councilor Caterina. Yeah, I, I just want to ask, I'm assuming, and maybe I, I should never assume, you know, that happens when you do that. And has there been pressure put on our legislative delegation or others to get the DEP to move? Uh, Senator Volk has made, okay. has made yeah. contact. And, uh, How about the others? Um, I think we've gone primarily, my understanding is Senator Volk has been the most effective. But you may yeah. want to get all of them. That's, that's great, my that's that, my that's, that's, that's uh, my experience with dealing with legislate legislature or with departments is if you can get the whole mm -hmm. delegation, including you know Senator Millett, um, McLean, who represents part of Scarborough, get them all, and say, hey, we need this. So 
That was my hesitate great to push too hard. They are understaffed and overworked. Uh, it doesn't the one thing that counts against us as well is this is an amendment to our current permit for the campus. And what comes with that is no deadline for their response. Mm -hmm. So they are pushing our project further back to deal with yeah. those that have deadlines associated. And that's really the, the circumstance we find ourselves right. in. We were told 30 projects are in the queue um, in, out of the Portland office. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Bowdoin College was number okay. one. Um, oh, you know, there's a number of projects that, you know, everyone, you know, no one's really speaking to it, but it's it's a combination of being under appraised, you know, underneath for the appraisal, over budget for the cost, or waiting for a permit or a combination of the three. Right. But and legislative pressure that, doesn't that, hurt. That's a great suggestion. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt from everybody. So. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. You've done Thank some you. good work. A ton of hard work for all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Do not hesitate to come back for advice or guidance or direction. Yeah, as we learn more, sale of the building, right. efficiency main rebates, the audit closes out, I think we'll be able in two or three months' time, I suspect, to have far more clarity where we can find that. Right. Well, we'd like nothing more than to invite you all to a groundbreaking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> before January. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
That's the uh, Scarborough Town Council Wednesday, October 17th, 2018 meeting. It's uh, uh, top of the hour, 7 o'clock. And I will call the meeting to order and ask everyone to rise to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, general public comments. Uh, anyone wishing to address the council on any issue not on the agenda, uh, please approach the podium and state your name and address. Three minutes. Thank you. Do I have to push any of these? No. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Michael Sawyer, and I live on Fort Track View Terrace. I think you guys are all doing a great job. Police department, fire department, and town council, and especially the town manager. He knows I get excited sometimes, so if my voice gets loud, just slap me up in the back of the head. <laughs> um, I hear a lot of talk about this, but I don't hear a lot of talk about what's going to do to Sawyer Road. Are we going to hear fire trucks and ambulances in the middle of the night when, it's, when they have to cut through to 114? Um, I come around the corner sometimes, and this run is four wide already, and, and so your road's not wide enough. If we need more solid, solid sidewalks all the way down, if we're going to have a fire <coughs> run, so the runners can run on the sidewalk, not in the middle of the road. We have most of the runs for the town, when they have a thing going on, goes down Sawyer Road. We have a lot of, like, Maple Ave cut through traffic now because I came down the other day, first thing in the morning, take my dog for a ride, which I do every day. Um, there was 15 cars waiting to come down Sawyer Road because they saw what was up at Oak Hill, line of traffic. Mm. So, you know, plus the fact when they have a function or a concert, this 30 people parked out by the deep ditch on Sawyer Road. Now, what if 30 more people want to park on the other side of the road? Where's the fire trucks and stuff's going to go then? And the same thing in the park. The police told me they basically it's a waste of their time to give 30 tickets out because they have better things to do. I agree with them. So we need to park an attendance or something like that or an easier way for the police to do their job. Maybe a scanner where you can take a picture of the license plate and it will automatically send out a ticket. I parked in to stop and save one night, five minutes before closing, ran to the back, I parked in illegally in the handicap, which I am legally handicapped, but I don't have a plate, and I got a ticket. It's worth their while to give one ticket out, but not 30. If somebody's breaking the law, they're breaking the law. It doesn't matter how many people there is. And they st it should be stopped, in my opinion. We've got to find some way to stop it. If you stop it, and you start giving out tickets, or start <coughs> pulling them, they wouldn't do it. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. I think the uh, neighbors on uh, Sawyer Road are interested in this issue. Uh, uh, the noise the congestion, and we have both chiefs here tonight. So I think we're going to take a moment to ask either chief to kind of address, it gives us the opportunity since we're all gathered here today. Uh, chief Moulton, would you, would you please try to address? I'll say one more thing. Uh, think about putting a stoplight at the one of 14 because it's not going to pull up now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would say that we certainly can appreciate Mr. Sawyer's comments, and we realize that it is going to change the the uh, nature of the roadway a bit, for sure. Um, in, the, in regards to your question about sirens at 2 o'clock in the morning and that kind of thing, uh, I, I don't believe that you're going to have that kind of issue. We, we uh, our building now is in a residential area. We don't go out through there, uh, you know, late at night or early in the morning with the sirens going and, and things. We use those when we get to a point in traffic where we really need to 
to make sure that we can get out. Now that's not to say that it that it couldn't happen at some point if there's a if there's a backup of traffic and we need to get out through there, we may have to sound the siren irregardless of what time or day or night it is. Uh, but that's certainly not going to be the practice. And I also know that people are concerned about the, the speed of uh, vehicles responding to emergencies and so forth. And again, I would just say that, you know, oftentimes we can't get out onto Route 1 and we end up going through the back neighborhood where we are now. We're really, you know, I mean, our, our, our officers and firefighters and so forth are trained in driving safely. They recognize the issues. Nobody wants to be in a situation where we hurt a child or... Or, or a dog or a person or anything else or have an accident. Um, that's not going to help us get to where we need to get to. So um, I, can't, I can't give you 100% assurance that it's never going to happen, but I can tell you that they're trained to, and when we respond to emergencies, oftentimes we are responding into neighborhoods and so forth. So that's something that we deal with uh, every day. So I, I hope that helps. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to address uh, the council on general comments? I'm um, Susan Hamill, and I live on Bay Street in Pine Point. And um, since the, uh, the Scarborough Downs tip is not on the agenda tonight, um, I'm, that's where I'm going to focus. Um, I have just three items that I'd, uh, I'd like to talk about. First, um, many taxpayers and members of the public have requested an independent financial analysis of the proposed Downs credit enhancement agreement. When will the analysis and assumptions be posted to the town website? Um, hoping that this is underway and, um, and that we'll see something. Secondly, um, I've been asking a lot of questions about town growth. And this is a really, this is an important um, issue when it comes to the development of the Downs, completely aside from all of the economic analysis. And it needs to be reviewed by the Council as part of the approval process for the Downs project. The 2006 Comprehensive Plan states that the primary focus of that update is on managing growth and development. <coughs> My analysis shows that in the past two years, about 1,000 housing units have either been approved by the planning board or are in the pipeline. Add the downs with another 2,000 units coming along. Right now, as a town, our housing composition is about 15% multifamily. When, with the downs and the other projects in the pipeline, this will change to 27% multi-unit. There's been no discussion by the council about how this will change the town. How fast do we want to grow? What are the consequences to the town's character and livability with so much growth so fast? How will the current growth ordinance operate in this environment? And these questions really need to be answered. When, when Rocky Rivera comes and wants his 2,000 growth permits, are we going to just hand them over? Um, or is there going to be more control on it? Um, and the third item is the public hearing on the downtown TIF is currently scheduled um, for no November 7th. It's the final meeting of the current council. Many members of the public have requested that the vote on the TIF be scheduled after this meeting, when the new council is seated. I'm asking the council to make a clear and unambiguous statement tonight that the vote will not occur until the new council is in place. Uh, thank you. Uh, did you receive my email? I did. And it did say that we are not going to vote on this on November 7th. CEA and the TIF. That's what you're asking about, right? That's the CEA. I'm asking about both the TIF and the CEA. Yes. And, you, and, and you understood I did say we're not going to vote on the CEA. I did. Okay, thank you. So does that answer that third point for you? Yes, and it's in, out in public, and viewers, everyone in town is now, it's part of the public record. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask the town manager to uh, address uh, uh, some of the issues raised by uh, Mrs. Hamill. Yes, we have uh, just today, uh, well, 
Uh, not quite. We're still trying to finalize the final scope of work, but we do have the intentions of hiring an independent uh, person to evaluate the overall analysis. Um, luckily, this person has time to devote immediately to this, so we'll have answers sooner than later. And uh, our intent is certainly to share that information, that analysis out publicly when we have it. With respect to town growth, uh, I do want to point out uh, Ms. Hamill uh, did have a detailed list of questions that was sent to the town planner, myself, and I think council was copied. Uh, town planner went to work this starting this afternoon, and I believe will finalize his response tomorrow, so uh, that will be forthcoming. Uh, beyond that, though, uh, surrounding issues of multifamily, this council will hopefully recall that back in December 2016, when you were considering the Gateway Commons or uh, the apartments on the Parkway, which was a large multifamily project. There were a series of detailed workshops and presentations around all these related issues um, and with a particular focus on multifamily because that was kind of the first, we we're at the head of the wave, if you will, of multifamily interest in Scarborough and Greater Portland. Um, I've actually looked back at many of those documents and some of them are still incredibly relevant. So I'll dust those off and share those back around again with you. I think uh, you'll remember those conversations, and that's not to say we shouldn't have ongoing conversations. We fully appreciate that as soon as the comprehensive plan is behind us, as soon as the spring or the summer next year, we should be talking in detail about the growth uh, management ordinance um, and, and all the related pieces. I think that uh, that's inevitable regardless of whether we have this project in front of us or not. That's an issue that needs to be addressed. And that, that has been the plan uh, so that everyone realizes that the comprehensive plan intends to address the growth management uh, uh, issues uh, as they are addressed in our growth management ordinance that presently exists. So we have from uh, our earlier years, uh, 10, 12, 14 years ago, uh, growth management provisions inserted into our ordinance. Uh, we included uh, Scarborough Downs as one of the areas where we where growth should occur in town rather than in other places, particularly other more rural places in town. So uh, we adopted in 2013 the Crossroads District for that purpose. So this has been something that the community and the town council uh, and the administration of the town have been addressing for quite some time, and we expect it will come back up in 2019. Just a final point, uh, just to be as thorough as we can, uh, to the question regarding what effect does uh, the growth management ordinance and the annual growth permits have on the Downs project. There is no provision that gives them any leniency or they're treated like any other developer will have to work within the confines of that regulation until it's changed. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address uh, public comment period? Close public comment period. Uh, uh, minutes of October 3, 2018, regular town council meeting. I accept a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, any comments, questions, amendments? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so Councillor Baybine uh, was held up, uh, but has been able to uh, join us. Councillor uh, Callazo is in Chicago. Uh, his company uh, has him on the road and has been for quite some time. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. I don't believe we have any adjustments. Items to be signed tonight will be the treasurer's warrants, which I will do uh, late, uh, at the end of the meeting. Uh, resolution 18-002, act on the request to establish a standing transportation committee. And I'll ask the town manager. Yes, to uh, it's unfortunate Councilor Kiaz is not here. He's been a liaison to this group and I think has mentioned this in passing that it's been long the desire of this committee um, to transform from an ad hoc committee to a standing committee of the town. And uh, so that committee has worked uh, diligently with staff to come up with uh, kind of an expanded scope of services. I don't think they've really, scope of work, they have not really uh, expanded it terribly uh, beyond even their ad hoc charge, uh, but added some governance uh, components consistent with how we're handling other standing committees. And so their strong recommendation and request to you is to uh, 
is to, to see it fit to uh, transform them to a standing committee so they can have ongoing responsibilities. Uh, public comment. Please approach the podium. Thank you. Uh, Judy Roy, 2nd Avenue. I'm a member of that transportation committee, and just uh, every, everybody, they, they left town on me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Angela Blanchett is the uh, staff representative on that committee. And uh, once we finish the Oak Hill pedestrian study, um, and I wasn't involved in that part of it, but once that was completed and sidewalks were put in and walkways and safety lights, the light that uh, the triangle that puts the cross through it for people staying uh, away from that left-hand uh, cross crosswalk, uh, that residents are traversing. We have the same condition down in Hanford. So what happened is we continued to work as an ad hoc committee, but uh, had asked on several occasions to have that ad hoc committee changed to a permanent committee. And we've done a, a number of things. I misplaced the paper, but we did traffic light uh, coordinations. Um, the complete streets is what, something we talked about in, in that committee. Uh, the general transit system, we've been talking with uh, Larissa uh, of late, uh, helping with that. Mm -hmm. And and just the, the mere fact of lowering traffic speed and, and uh, calming the Route 1 corridor as it certainly exists. And there are several other projects that we've you know, been, been involved in over the time we've been waiting to be a true committee and not just an ad hoc committee. So with that, I hope you uh, give us a chance. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. Anyone else wishing to address this uh, order? Accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Peter. Yeah, actually just a, <clears throat> based on the comments, just a little bit of history maybe from the chair or the town manager. It, when it's come up before to be, you know, a permanent committee, why, what was the Congress, what was sort of the pros and cons and why it was decided not to do that? Is, is there any... I don't believe that a formal request ever came forward to this, this level. I think ah, okay. uh, it's just been a long desire, and they finally got to the point that it's time to go up and, and bring this forward. So it's never been rebuffed. It's just never come forward. Before. It's never come forward. Okay, okay. thank you. Councilor Katerina. Uh, again, uh, given uh, the development uh, in town and coming to town, to me it makes perfect sense to have a transportation committee that's a standing committee rather than a so-called ad hoc committee. So I would support this. Council Rowan. Yeah, I support it as well, and I appreciate the uh, committee for bringing it forward and desiring to uh, continue to serve in that capacity. Councilor Foley. Repeat what they said, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, obviously as we continue to grow um, transportation, and, and we all feel it, especially in the summer months, um, as we get a little bit more and more congested, so I think it's it's a good thing to have. Councilor Beebein. Um <clears throat> First, um, I will be entertaining a motion to amend something, and I'll explain it in a minute, but I do want to thank all the members of the committee um, because it takes a lot um, and I think that it's perfect that we take this up immediately after public comments that talks about how the council must take into consideration different aspects of um, growth and all other you know things that are going on and the fact is that um, as a council of seven we rely on a lot of committees in which Ms. Roy serves on a lot of those committees um, for their expertise and their um, involvement so I want to say thank you. The motion is actually to amend and to appoint each of the current members of the ad hoc committee um, as sitting members, because that is required as part of our rules and policies, um, and that um, their, their terms, um, their terms and expirations should be determined by the um, town clerk and the council liaison. And that's in a form of a uh, motion to amend. A oh, second. Second. Uh, discussion on the motion to amend. Very quick. It saves the appointments committee a lot of time because they've been doing a lot of work, and we don't have to go through applications and all this other kind of crazy stuff, let's just go ahead and appoint them. Further comment? Councilor Foley? Just a question, is the committee, are they totally full right now or would there be any room for additional members? I think we're totally full right now. Other comments? All in favor of the motion to amend? Opposed? Uh, main motion as amended, uh, further discussion? Mm -mm. Uh, I, uh, I think transportation is probably one of the key issues this town is facing. Uh, uh, we've heard from Mr. Sawyer tonight, we've heard from many others that 
They want us to make sure that we carefully analyze. And having a standing committee is tremendously helpful uh, because those are people who are interested in that issue and volunteer uh, and do a lot of the legwork uh, to be able to intelligently present these sorts of issues to the town council. Uh, with that, I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, old business. None at this time. New business. Order 18-70. First reading and refer to the planning board on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section Roman Numeral 6, Definitions, Affordable Housing. Uh, <coughs> this matter has been before us before, but for reasons that Councilor Rowan will explain, we're restarting the process. Councilor Rowan? Yes, thank you. I, I mentioned in um, my liaison report last time that uh, the uh, amendment that was brought forward, unfortunately, was a, a marked up version of our working copy and not a marked up version of the ordinance. Um, so what you have tonight is not substantially different than what we've already put through first reading and sent to the planning board, uh, but it is the correct um, additions and deletions are highlighted correctly. Um, there are a couple of clarifications. It was reworded slightly, uh, but the intent of uh, this ordinance is still um, to further clarify who qualifies um, to either purchase an affordable, uh, uh, a unit that has been, um, uh, a, a unit that has been uh, encumbered with the affordable um, designation. Um, or uh, to rent it. And so the first section deals with who qualifies and how they qualify. And then um, more importantly for um, moving forward for the downs especially is how should the developers be pricing either the rent or the sale price? Um, because there was some confusion where it was really written in relation to the buyer. But if you don't know who the buyer is, how do you market a price? Uh, and then uh, the last edition is really about what, how do you, what happens when this unit comes up either for resale or if it's a uh, rental unit, how do you continue to certify? Thank you. Public comment on this order. Close public comment. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. This matter's been pretty well discussed. Council Katerine. I just have a quick question, and it has to do with uh, Section 7CC in the sale. I'm assuming that there's going to be something in the deeds that's, okay. Exactly, yep. So it's, going to be it's just a real estate question. <laughs> Further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous, thank you. Order 18-71, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 303, the Town of Scarborough Personnel Ordinance, and uh, the HR Director, uh, Liam Gallagher, is here to present uh, this issue. Good evening, uh, Liam Gallagher, Director of Human Resources. <clears throat> uh, the, the proposed order in front of you this evening for first reading is uh, an amendment to the personnel ordinance. It's um, a fairly significant <coughs> amendment as far as um, impact, but rel relatively minimal as far as language. Um, what we're proposing to do is effective January 1st, we'd like to uh, modify the medical insurance program for all non-union personnel um, to parallel the change that was adopted by uh, the police contract uh, this past July and uh, mirror the, the proposed change in the dispatch contract before you this evening. Um, it would uh, essentially uh, accomplish the two objectives we had through our collective bargaining, uh, which is to gain participation from single policyholders uh, and also standardize the uh, employer contribution to the plans irrespective of plan selection. So um, right now there's a, you know, depending on, we offer two plans, we're proposing to retain those two plans. We thought that was an important uh, benefit to, to continue. Uh, but the, the change is really that we're fixing that employer cost. So whether an employee selects uh, the, the more comprehensive of the two options or the more affordable of the two options, the employer contribution to that plan is fixed. Um, so those are the objectives we, we had through collective bargaining. That's the change we'd like to see for uh, equity purpose uh, be extended to our non-union personnel. Just to speak to the impact, um, well, we have currently 101 full-time non-union personnel. Um, it's about 58% of our total workforce. Um, and the impact, the fiscal impact of this change 
would, uh, we project would save about $43,000 annually. Again, those are based on 2018 rates. Um, those, you know, as the rates increase, as they inevitably will, the, the opportunity for that savings will increase as well. So um, we think this change is, a, is appropriate. We think it's a, a fair change to make as we compare our benefits package to our, our neighboring municipalities. Um, and I think it's one that, um, again, for the, for the sake of equity across our employee groups, is important to, to extend. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Mr. Gallagher? Yeah. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just just a, <clears throat> a quick question. So you're you're suggesting this proposal will save an estimated, and I'm assuming that's it will save the town an estimated forty three thousand dollars over a twelve month period. In the past, as we've estimated these, are we have we been pretty close to the estimates? As as we've said, we think these shifts we're going to save X, Y, or Z. And do so, we actually do we get the results that we want, or yeah. is it kind of a uh, so it, obviously, yeah, well, it's, it's unknown to some degree, right? So, um, you know, we're presuming that the, the current enrollment of, um, you know, we have uh, 30 some odd single mm -hmm. policies and however many family policies stay consistent. You know, one person goes out and, um, you know, gets married, that's a $7,000 swing that we didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. So it's presuming that... Uh, that the census will stay static, uh, which likely won't be the case, but um, I don't have enough information, Councillor Hayes, to say um, over, you know, what our population has done over the last mm -hmm. few years to try to factor that into the analysis. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Public uh, comment. Anyone wishing to address this <clears throat> order? Please approach the podium. Did I gather you too quickly? Uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. <laughs> Further discussion. Uh, it's uh, it's a sensible proposal. It aligns with uh, our goals and objectives in a broader sense, and so I support this. Uh, any further comments before we vote? All in favor? <laughs> Councilor Hayes. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I was, I was going to make a comment, but I wasn't quick enough. Um, it, it, it's kind of a suggestion going forward. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this. I mean, health care is becoming a huge issue for every every town, every business, and <laughs> it's kind of a moving target. I don't know in the future whether it would be worth having, you know, some others around the table, but, you know, there are a lot of benefit consultants in town that might be willing to volunteer to help guide some of the conversations. But it it might be helpful in just really trying to figure out a longer term strategy about this is what I do every day too and it's it's a moving target. It's really difficult. So I think going forward it's so much money that the more heads that can get around sort of the strategy would be helpful. It's a good suggestion. Uh, and Councillor Hayes happens to have expertise in this field, so we have someone on the board uh, who will uh, benefit us all. Other comments? There's a vote. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Order 18-72, act on the request to ratify the collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Scarborough and the Scarborough Professional Dispatchers Unit of Scarborough Firefighter, Firefighter Association, IAFF number 3894. And I'd ask Mr. Gallagher to introduce this order. Good evening. Um, <laughs> so, uh, per my um, memorandum to the council, um, the the order before you this this evening uh, is to ratify a successor agreement for our dispatcher unit. Um, just to speak to the makeup of this unit, this covers 15 employees, uh, 11 of which are dispatchers, and four of which are lead dispatchers who take a supervisory role. Uh, the the terms of this proposed agreement. Um, Again, always uh, the economic items are always significant, um, but the the relative changes, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to this. Um, you know, oftentimes or, or at times you can go into collective bargaining and there are, there are operational issues at hand, and these are purely economic. Uh, we had one objective with this group, uh, which was to achieve that medical insurance change, uh, the program shift that we we just spoke about with the non-union group that we achieved with the uh, police collective bargaining group. 
Um, and they had a, a few ideas of their own, of course. Um, the, the, uh, so the medical insurance change, as I, as I just referenced, um, would, uh, again, fix employer costs uh, irrespective of plan. It would gain participation from single policyholders. Um, and uh, the other items around this are simply wages and a few other economic uh, incentives. They came to the table uh, seeking some uh, review of the differential between uh, the dispatcher pay and the lead supervisor, the lead dispatcher pay. Um, the, the differential at the time was 5%. They uh, looked at uh, other equivalents, both inside and outside the organization. They felt that that differential, that, that difference between the pay should be more significant than 5%. Uh, so there is a, a proposed uh, proposal in this contract to deal with that issue. It, it essentially provides a 1% uh, additional uh, cost of living adjustment in year two and 2% in year three to grow that gap to essentially a 9%, uh, I'm sorry, an 8% differential between the, the employee and the supervisor. Um, another item that they sought was a, a modest increase uh, to the educational incentive. This is an incentive that rewards and recognizes uh, employees who have achieved uh, additional education. Um, so we've, we've slightly revamped how we do that. Uh, previously, this was a, an incentive that was provided for relevant coursework or uh, courses based on credit hour. Uh, we've proposed to shift this to actually recognize degrees completed. Um, it's not a compounding feature, so if you have two master's degrees, as, as at least one unit member has, you're only being recognized for, the, for one master's degree. Um, and again, that's a fairly nominal shift uh, in the proposal. Um, I know that uh, when we have discussions around the, fisc you know, the economic impact of these agreements, uh, we've kind of gone back and forth about how we evaluate what it is before the council. Um, there have been suggestions that we should look at uh, what a static status quo would look like versus what we're proposing to approve. Um, a static status quo for me would be um, if there were no uh, cost of living adjustments to the pay scale, essentially a zero, zero, zero contract over a three-year term. Um, and, you know, but a static status quo would still afford employees step increases. So there is movement along the pay scale for some employees eligible for step increases, but otherwise there would be no other pay adjustments. So uh, how does that look versus what we're bringing forward to council for consideration? Um, I think historically, and speaking from uh, Everything that I know about municipal collective bargaining, a concept of a 0% uh, per year agreement over three years, I've never heard of. I've heard of um, freezing rate increases for a period of time, but certainly not over the span of a contract. Um, looking historically at our collective bargaining agreements here in Scarborough, uh, sort of the standard bearer is a 2.5% cost of living adjustment per year. Um, so how does that stack up against the other changes we've uh, included in this contract with higher than just 2.5% cost of living adjustments? So I know that there was some information provided to the council uh, this afternoon um, in reference to some of those metrics that I'm, I'm happy to um, speak to this evening. Um, so uh, one of the, if the council recalls when we approved the uh, police collective bargaining agreement, we looked at the the year over year percentage impact uh, to sort of evaluate this this concept that the council has uh, has uh, discussed in years past about a three percent or no more than uh, impact and so how does this stack up to that? Um, based on uh, what once we factor in uh, the cost of living adjustments, uh, the the differential adjustments, the educational incentive adjustments, and factor in the anticipated medical savings, um, in year one, it's a 3.96% increase um, over current. In year two, it's a 4.79% increase. And in year three, it's a 4.16% increase. Um, so over the, over the span of the contract, it, it equates to a 12.91% cumulative uh, increase. Um, as we look at that against the approved police collective bargaining agreement, um, that was actually higher. Um, while there was a, a slight increase in year two, that was a 14.52% increase year over year when, when added up. Um, as, we, as we look at this uh, proposed agreement against that standard bearer 2.5% contract, um, 
this essentially over the span of the contract, I, I anticipate will cost uh, just over $7,800 more than that standard contract. So um, just over $2,500 more per year for a unit that covers 15 employees. So it's um, so as far as measuring that, if we want to say that that's a, a, a better um, a better metric to weigh it against, um, it's it comes in fairly close to the same sort of overall terms and conditions of the police contract previously approved. Did you uh, look at on the percentage differential issue uh, how that? Uh, uh, compared with other municipalities? So that was information that uh, the union brought forward that we, we verified. Um, it's tough to, um, there's been so much movement with communication centers over the, over the years. Uh, there's been a, there was a regionalization effort in Sanford mm -hmm. a few years back, which really took on a lot of municipalities. It's difficult to find an apples to apples comparison, but their suggestion that that differential between the standard dispatcher and a lead or, or supervisory role uh, was inadequate at 5%, we, we felt was appropriate. So yes, we did look at comparisons. We didn't think that that was out of the market to suggest that that's an appropriate differential to have. Uh, looking internally, uh, patrol officers and sergeants, there's a 12% differential, and the fire department has a, has a significantly higher differential, but they play, they, they uh, apply their promotional pay scales differently than uh, dispatch and, and patrol do. It does the uh, differential adjustment that is being made by this contract, in your view, uh, achieve a fair balance, uh, or are we only part of the way there, or is that in the eyes of the beholder? Uh, it's uh, you know I think it's something that you have to look at. You have to look at the big picture. You know um, the the next round of discussions will be. Uh, a little more than two years from now, um, what the economic realities are, uh, where we are as a center, uh, could all change. What the the I mean, there's a whole there's a, a lot of variables. Do I think that um, we concluded our discussions by by saying this is a you know a step in the right direction and we'll continue this path? Uh, you know, admittedly we didn't. Do I think that um, you know there may be a suggestion next time around that's another <coughs> thing they'd like to look at? Quite possibly. Um, but it wasn't something that we uh, concluded the discussion on the issue of differential and thought that this would be a step-by-step -step process. Thank you. Yes. Questions for Mr. Gallagher? For the questions, thank you. Okay. Public comment on the, on the contract. Please approach the podium. Good evening. My name is Don Hamill. I live on Bay Street in mm -hmm. Pine Point. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions. I mean, it's a little hard for the public to react to this because we're hearing numbers, you know, that are being shared verbally or orally. Uh, we're not really able to look at anything on paper. The numbers that I've heard um, sound quite high to me, and I thought it was interesting to note that the head of human resources indicated that we basically just took the union's statistics and validated those. So in my experience, what's typically done is some sort of wage and benefit review and a thing called an authority request. I understand in our form of governance that currently exists, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a negotiations committee. So I'd be kind of curious what oversight we had from that committee and this whole effort. Uh, there also is typically, when you cost out a contract, we don't, you don't typically quote numbers in terms of individual impact, you're talking about the total impact of to the town, the total cost of to the town year on year. So if I'm looking at contracts over the span of three years that are worth over 14% in the case of the police contract and over 12% uh, in the case of the, the fire contract, uh, in my experience, I've really never seen uh, people you know, try to rely only on normalizing across bargaining units. Typically, they try to normalize that based upon what the competition is and the similar services that are provided you know, in the area in other towns. So I know that we live in a changing world and it's hard to, to do apples to apples comparisons, but people get asked to do this all the time. And the fact that we don't see any of these figures on paper and have not had any chance to look at these ahead of time, it's highly unusual. Reflecting back on the police contract, uh, and I don't want anyone to interpret this as being any kind of statement against organized employees, 
you know, I devoted my career to working in this realm. <clears throat> but, but the fact that that was under significant deadline pressure, and we kind of used that as a, a reason or an explanation for why we didn't have a chance to have more of a full and fair review about these things. So I'd like to understand better the process that we plan to follow in the future since this looks like it's pretty well far along in the approval process. And it's really quite puzzling to me, maybe disturbing as a more, more careful characterization. But uh, this does not seem like a process that is transparent and is that you know, fully, fully vetted and has full opportunity for the public to truly understand what, what the impact is. And we're doing this in an environment that we all admit budgets are tight. We're going to have increasing costs all around. So those are, you know, that's, I apologize, it's not a single question. It's a series of questions. But uh, they have to do with process. And they have to do with inclusion. They have to do with transparency. And uh, this is something that I think that uh, is a basic request. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Close the public comment, uh, except the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Councilor Baybine, would you like to report on the appointments and negotiations committee's uh, uh, coverage of this? I think that um, our HR manager has um, provided the over um, the oversight. I'm sorry, the details. Um, I did want to mention at least, even though he provided um, the uh, percentage. <clears throat> The net increase on a dollar basis in year one is a increase of twenty thousand um, dollars, and I'm rounding. It's twenty thousand three fifty three forty four. So, please allow me to round uh, to the closest thousand. Um, year two is forty two thousand, and year three is sixty seven. So, the net over a three year period is one hundred twenty nine thousand dollars increase in the overall budget related to these employees. Um, as far as I was, sorry, I was actually trying to look up the actual language to quote regarding. The negotiations, um, the process as far as um, this committee, um, the, the appointments and negotiations, um, to be specific about what we are charged with. We are not a negotiating um, um, group. We do not sit at the negotiated table um, with staff and with the employees or the bargaining unit at all. Um, that is what our staff is for. Uh, we provide oversight to make sure that um, the uh, contracts are being negotiated consistently with what has been understood um, to be the direction of the council. Um, as far as my personally, um, I can state that as chair of that committee that um, <coughs> the HR manager and, and the manager himself um, negotiated um, no differently than what the last contract, which was uh, the police uh, department's contract. They negotiated the same tenants under the same considerations. The difference was the timeline because um, sometimes when things are back to back, you can't do it all at once. And, so um, this unit was uh, willing to at least wait, um, and um, um, they pushed through that. So I'm comfortable with the uh, manager's descriptions of what in, um, occurred um, as far as that process. The uh, 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 appointments and negotiations committee uh, met in executive session with uh, Mr. Gallagher and the town manager for the purpose of being able to evaluate the contract, uh, which uh, – and. Uh, executive session because it is a uh, bargaining unit contract is the normal process uh, but we wanted to allow uh, uh, an open discussion uh, at the public hearing today we also published the uh, contract itself and the uh, schedule of rates uh, as a part of the materials so that anyone who had an interest in digging deeper into this uh, had that material available as of last Friday. So, uh, good. Uh, I'll accept a motion. No. Sorry, yes. no. There's a motion. Just a Com uh, uh, comments. Councilor comments. Yeah. So, um, on a personal basis, the comments. First, I want to th say thank you to the employees that um, went through this process, so as well as our team of expert, uh, what I consider experts. Um, they are um, HR professionals. Um, I do want to mention that um, to suggest that this process needs to be more transparent um, contradicts completely the essence of a bargaining unit and the importance of having that privacy so that the town staff can negotiate with its employees in good faith about what they want in order to be good employees or better employees within our uh, community. Um, and, and particularly as we deal with um, this as one part of that 
um, group is that, because um, they're all very valuable, is that you know, we're dealing with first responders. Um, dispatch is a part of that first responder team. And so um, providing them with the benefits that they've asked for, um, given the concession, and it's very significant if you look at the breakdown, the medical change alone actually is a cost savings over time. I, I want to say um, it's $30,000 over that three-year period. So their willingness to change um, in that area to be consistent with the other bargaining units, as well as now with the non-bargaining units, um, I think is, is very generous um, as we try to make um, or have everyone um, at parity uh, within our organization. So um, I think this is a very good contract. I want to thank Liam for his work that he did on this, as well as the manager. Um, but any notion that we need to be more transparent is just absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Other uh, comments? Councilor Yeah, I, mean, I think I'm not quite sure how to articulate this and I will support this tonight because because I, I think it, I mean we're talking 15 employees and, and for some of the comments we made, but I do think, and I'm not sure where the conversation belongs within this body, but I think there needs to be a process for us to think about if we continue to want to have a goal of no more than three percent, but 80 percent of our costs are payroll related, and the contracts keep coming in at four or five or six percent. Um, that makes our goal really hard to achieve. So I, I don't know how we collectively, where it sits in which body, whether it's the negotiation or finance, but as we start these contracts, how do we maybe articulate what the council's goals would be before negotiations start about where we want the outcomes to be? But once one, so in this case, one contract got settled and we're benchmarking the second one against it, which I understand. But I think we need to have a, a conversation somewhere within this body about what, what is our policy around payroll increases and how we're going to do that and how we're going to manage it. And I think it's a combination of finance, maybe negotiations. I don't know how we do that, but I, I, I pose that to, you know, like as we reform into next year, how do we go about that process? Thank you. Other, comment, other comments? <coughs> so none. Uh, ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> Order 18-73, uh, act on the request to authorize the sale of a tax-acquired property located at 127 Holmes Road to a Daniel, Daniel Soley uh, and to authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents necessary, and I'd ask the <coughs> town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, uh, this matter is before you. I believe at your last meeting, if not that, the, the one just uh, before that. Uh, this was one of uh, five different properties that we advertised for sale. Uh, this council actually awarded it to another bidder, a Mr. Norton, at a higher price. He has since rescinded his, uh, his offer, and so we're back before you to award it to the next lowest and the only other bidder, uh, Mr. Soley. And this is for a property located at 127 Holmes Road. We recommend your approval. A public comment on the order. Please approach the podium. None. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Kettering. This is just a real estate question that came to mind. Uh, Mr. Soley's bid, he says here, uh, my bid is not subject to financing, cash, and resource purchase are currently available on hand. I, um, again, I should never assume anything, but do we have proof of those funds? Uh, we only accept certain forms of payment, so I will not sign a deed until I know okay. uh, funds Just check. are. Other comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, non action items, non standing special committee reports. It's, Peter, you want to start down at the end? Yeah, I've got sort of three to report on. One, the, the Shellfish Commission did meet. Um, they are, this is the time of year when we start talking about licenses and the health of the resource and other things. The town manager and I have had some conversation. We still are, are, are working toward how do we find out what's the right way to measure the resource of, our, our, of the, the, the clam flats and other things and how are we going to do that. So. There is a new harbor master that's coming on. And Tom, mm -hmm. I cannot pronounce the name, so I'll probably butcher it. Are you? <laughs> Angelo Mazzoni. Oh, Angelo. He's a, oh. 
they worked with, with us previously and is coming back, and, and I think that would be a terrific addition. So, so we've had some conversations about trying one of his, his first duty, not first duties, but challenge will be how do we finesse that conversation. To the Coastal Harbor Met, the, the last time we were here, we talked a little bit about the, the Maori permits. A question was asked about what are some of the enforcement or penalties that's gone back there working on that. But what I really wanted to talk about is actually the Finance Committee, which did meet last night, and really, really want to compliment the staff. And, and I've been fortunate enough to work. We've worked how long, Sean? Our, four years. Our groups, four years. Um, what I've passed out in front of us tonight is some of the, you know, sort of the, the, the output of that work. And I think we're pretty excited about announcing some of the things. We talked about three major things last night. The last time we had talked, we approved a new sort of debt and finance policy in there. There is language in there saying about we should really form an equipment reserve account. So we, instead of having to, when we need to replace equipment, maybe go to have to bond it. Is there a way we can start setting some money aside? We talked about that. We decided that it's something as a finance committee we still wanted to pursue. Staff's going to come back with some recommendations. They did a lot of work about given us some parameters and some estimates, and they actually identified several different <coughs> sources of, way we, of ways we could do that, so we're going to progress on that. Um, the other thing, though, and, and I'll kind of draw our attention, everybody, and I apologize, we can get these up online, but the first colorful thing you have in front of us today, um, I think this is actually was Councillor Babine's idea a long time ago, is there a way that we could make a dashboard of the financial health of our community really easy to follow and understand. And actually, staff's done a great job to come up with some metrics. We've got some charts and some really simple sort of green light, yellow light, red lights of where we're healthy, where we may want to look at things. Um, so we'll be, there'll be more on this. This is kind of a revised draft that's coming. Um, you know, there are some metrics that we have here. And again, the, the green little oxycons, I guess, what, what would you call them? The Hexagons. Hexagons. Hexagons are, are where, you know, we're in a good place. Yellow is caution. <laughs> Down at the bottom, we've done an overall indicator of the, you know, physical health of our community. And again, it's kind of the same red, yellow, green. So we will be revising that. We'll talk about that. Our thought is this will be a document that the Finance Committee will share going forward once a year or so, just to say here's a snapshot of this is a work in progress. So we'll have more conversations, but we just wanted to share with you, that with you tonight. The second thing we've talked about, and we're, we're happy to say this, we've talked a lot in the last couple of years about, say, geez, is there a way that we can start doing some type of financial model, modeling and financial planning? And again, there's sort of a two-step process. What was brought to us by Larissa, the, the assistant town manager, Larissa Crockett, was a great way to start doing a long-term financial planning model. It's built off, she's done a lot of work, it's built off a model that's being done um, in Slan Clemente, California. Um, there's a reference here, it's in the materials, you can go out and look at it. We're gonna be using that as sort of a model for what we do going forward. We'll come back to the rest of the, the council as we get closer to that. Um, I think next time they can maybe bring you back to some easy to understand exhibits of that. Mm -hmm. In the short term, though, the next finance committee meeting, we also are going to take our first look at really trying to do a three-year financial model where we will, we will try to project, project out revenues as uh, make some assumptions about what that will look like based on what we know today. Same thing with expenditures, same things with a sort of assessed value so we can start to look at what might that look like for tax rates going forward for planning purposes. When do we... Maybe we want to make some investments in the community. Where do we need to be concerned? So I think for us, this is doesn't sound like a lot, but for the finance committee, this is kind of an exciting deliverable for us. We've been working on this for a while, and just thought I'd share that with the rest of, of the town Thank you. council, and there'll be more to come and more conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the materials, uh, just so the councilors understand, uh, they're really looking at three years, that little bar that goes across and it starts on the left, goes to the right. Uh, uh, when it bends, that's the second year, and then reaches its end point, that's the third year. We're, we're going to have uh, Larissa work on making it more user-friendly so people, uh, the public will be able to catch up and understand exactly where we are. And the two parallel bars are really, those are the measures that we 
already established mm -hmm. as being appropriate, kind of this is where we should kind of be, but here's a, a warning sign where we're exceeding uh, and clearly need to, to make some adjustments. So, Yeah, and I guess I'd add kind of, kind of piggybacking on the conversation we had earlier, one of the places where was identified that we get a yellow or a thing we should be looking at is general fund expenditures as a percent of assessed value. So what's been happening is our expenditures have been increasing at an increasing rate of our assessed value, which means it can indicate that, that our management of expenditures are something we really want to pay attention to, and that really ties into our biggest expenditure is payroll and related benefits. So that, that, that's an area that probably is, is some, a body of work for this group in the coming years. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, senior advisory met um, the other day on Tuesday morning, um, continuing to work on aging, um, getting certification of being an aging friendly uh, community. We did a talk, and I just want to put this out to any counselors who may be available on election day. There will be a community services table. And we're also putting a table out as the town um, mm -hmm. to do with surveys and information on various factors. But if you would like to help out, that would be great. And you can talk to uh, community services about that. Um, the seniors were really the ones pushing it, having a table with information or whatever. So uh, I have to teach that day, so I can't help. I don't know how I managed to do that much schedule, but I did. Um, <laughs> Ordinance is tomorrow at 4.30. Uh, we will be talking about uh, parking on rights of way, you know, in other words, how far up the, the pavement and whatever you need to be. So if that's of interest to you, please come. Front yard setbacks, in particular when you're a house on a corner, you get two front yard setbacks, and we're gonna talk about whether that is or is not an issue here in Scarborough. Um, the police chief is bringing forth Mass something new, mass gathering, and I'm looking at Chief Moulton now. And then uh, penalties, we're going to talk about those penalties um, on moorings, with the moorings uh, tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And I will give you some Italian lessons so you can learn how to <laughs> pronounce Mazzoni. I'm going to have to learn, yeah. Right. That's it for me. <laughs> and we did, we did have a question uh, that came up. I think Councilor Keza yeah. raised it with me about the applicability of the horse on the beach. Oh, we are gonna do that or, tomorrow, ordinance. No, but, I, oh. but I'm reminded that uh, we had deferred application of the yeah. ordinance oh, right. for a year so as to allow the uh, horse community to uh, adjust to the new rule. Well, October 1st is the date of application, so it's now in effect. Okay. And it's, I just say it as a point of information to the public. Councilor Pope. I have none. Thank you. Nothing. I have nothing. Okay. Uh, let's see, I guess I attended the Ordinance Committee meeting and the <laughs> Finance Committee <laughs> meeting, but those have both been uh, reported. So let's move to the manager's uh, report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I mentioned, in, maybe in passing at the uh, workshop, uh, the town uh, had some welcome news from uh, the state of Maine. Uh, back in 1999, this town invested in a, and I should say voluntarily, we invested in a new salt shed. And this was during a time where the state was prioritizing kind of uh, the worst case scenarios. In many cases, water bodies were being affected. So we were a so-called priority five. The state has been working ever since to fund, uh, by way of reimbursement, um, all of those communities that, that built new, new facilities. And they're finally now reaching priority five communities. So uh, we did get an unexpected $124,000 to reimburse that expense, uh, again, from 1999. Um, perhaps you passed on the way in here in the alcove. Uh, we have early voting that is up and running. And I will just give a quick report. Tody says, as of today, close of business, we have issued 2,195 uh, absentee ballots, 822 of which have been returned. And uh, we do expect things will continue to be brisk all the way through and up to um, including Election Day. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the state of Maine has provided us uh, 16,800 ballots, essentially wow. a ballot for every registered voter. They anticipate uh, high turnout, obviously. Uh, so uh, 
it should be interesting. Uh, as part of that, we're trying to take advantage of the traffic coming in and out of Town Hall. We have set up a station out here, and we have it manned somewhat throughout the day, but it's self-service. We're, at this point, doing three things, and we have opportunity to do more if, if uh, there's good ideas, but we're using the opportunity to survey residents regarding recreational and medical use marijuana. Mm -hmm. The Ordinance Committee has been struggling with this and would like some feedback from the community before it proceeds. Uh, we're also, we've produced a uh, frequently asked question and kind of a handout regarding the Downs Credit Enhancement conversation that is ongoing that uh, is just an informational piece. Uh, we've tried very hard to be educational as opposed to advocacy in this document. Um, we do envision this will evolve as things progress, but in the meantime, we'd like to keep supplying people with information. And lastly, we have a sign-up for our e-newsletter. E We'd really like to get as many residents as possible signing up for that. We do uh, bi-monthly installments and then as needed, you know, with, uh, with notices beyond that. But we'd love to get membership um, much, much higher in that regard. With respect to the TIF and the credit enhancement uh, conversation, just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters for your agenda. Council Donovan may cover this uh, a bit further, but this council has a workshop a week from tonight, October 24th. The point of that uh, is, is specifically to talk about what, if anything, the town wishes to do with its portion of TIF proceeds uh, after, um, and, and those are choices that are entirely yours. So we'll be prepared with some recommendations, some conversation around that. We'd like to get directly, <coughs> really so we can finalize the documents uh, in anticipation of the public hearing, which, uh, as was uh, mentioned, is scheduled for November 7th. I've also scheduled another one of the informational meetings for October 30th here in Council Chambers. And uh, that's likely to be the last session before at least the public hearing, uh, depending where we go from there, we'll continue in that, in that pattern. Uh, I'd like to, I guess, suggest, uh, the chairman and myself have talked about it, and the clerk as well, uh, the second meeting in November for the council is scheduled for November 21st. That's the mm. day before Thanksgiving. Yeah, we we think that might be problematic for folks. Yeah. <laughs> you think? So uh, we've been talking just at the staff level that perhaps we move that to the following week, the 28th. Mm. And without objection, we'd like to start publicizing that soon. Yeah, that's fine. And last piece of information, uh, the Board of Assessment Review will be taking up an uh, abatement appeal on behalf of Walmart and Sam's Club. I mention it because they're two large commercial um, taxpayers in town. Uh, they do have appraisals, and so we'll be supplying uh, some technical support for our staff as well in mm -hmm. defense of those conversations. But that hearing is scheduled for November 13th, and I'll keep you apprised as it moves forward. Thank you. Good. Uh, council member comments. Start, start down with Councillor Bateman. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the community chamber for hosting the community forum for our candidates. I thought it was uh, um, a wonderful view from home. Um, and what I could tell, it looked like it was a pretty uh, um, pretty crowded uh, mm. chamber. So I'm glad I actually stayed home and watched it. But thank you to all the candidates that participated. And uh, um, I think it was um, I think it's going to be on a couple more times uh, to be able to watch it. So. Um, thank you very much for them to doing that. They do it every year. And Kevin just has that natural uh, facilitation and uh, kind of that TV presence that uh, makes it very comfortable and very appealing. So thank you to Councilor Kevin. Bateman, if I could, I want to take full responsibility for the decision to hold that session here. I did that. I know it was uncomfortable for those that were in attendance, but I did it to assure that we'd have good quality audio yeah. and video. Yeah. And I think the value of that session will be seen over the coming weeks as we rebroadcast that. Yeah. So. For those that were discomforted, I apologize, but I did it for a reason. Yeah. Thank you. And I thought it was organized very well as far as how they broke it up, so it was very easy to, um, it was a very easy flow, so thank you to them. Um, and lastly, um, and I, I, I don't, I'm uh, sorry, I was thinking that it might have been private, but it's not. So um, I believe the school board, if I can make this announcement, the school board and the school department will be um, hosting a function on Saturday the 21st at Wentworth School for uh, Birthing. Whatever Saturday is. Sunday. 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 Is it Sunday the 22nd? 20, oh, Sunday? Sunday oh, I thought it was okay. I have it in my calendar, <laughs> so I apologize. So Sunday the 22nd to recognize uh, the commitment and the uh, contributions that Jackie Perry has given to our town over the last 40 years. I believe she's served on the school board in um, different terms, but almost at least 30, if not more than that. So uh, 
want to say thank you for the school for recognizing her because uh, there are a lot of people that have done exactly what she's done and it's pretty incredible nowadays uh, for her to retire and uh, we should give her thanks uh, for her contribution but um, I hope everybody can go. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, thank you. I, I voted this evening. It was very easy and fast so um, <laughs> just a reminder for everyone to get out and vote. Thank you. That's the vote. I have none. Thank you. Councilor Katerina. Yeah, just real quickly, I, I know it's campaign season, um, and being the ordinance chair, I get an awful lot of complaints. People will call me first, but I'm calling Tody, <laughs> sorry Tody, about signs. Um, and uh, candidates just, you know, remember where your signs belong, don't belong. It's looking a lot better than it did, but there are still some large signs out there that they can't be more than six square feet, so they may disappear if you don't take care of them. Um, and just, you know, I, I do know it's campaign season. I, I personally, this is just me personally, I do get a little frustrated, more than a little frustrated with um, people out there saying, oh, there's a lack of transparency and there's no communication and this and that. Um, with the council, this council, um, well, I first was on the council starting in 2013, and since 2013, I've seen us improve light years with uh, what's out there. Um, just an example is like the table out, you know, we're, we're doing surveys, we're gathering information, um, communicating the workshops that we've had on the downs, the uh, work that the, uh, the chiefs did with the public safety building going out in the community, I don't know any communities that do as much as we do, to be honest with you. And I get asked by other councilors or select people from other towns, because I'm on the main municipal uh, a legislative policy committee, they're always pretty impressed by what we're doing in Scarborough. So, you know, I want to uh, make sure that uh, people understand that. Uh, and I want to give uh, particular kudos to assistant uh, manager Crockett because I think, well I know, having her come on board has been a huge part of that because it does free up Manager Hall to be doing the nuts and bolts that he really needs to be doing and she does a really good job of, of taking care of making sure communication's out there. So I'm hoping we don't confuse lack of transparency and, and no communication with just because we don't agree and our votes are different than when you expect them to be. That, that's what you think's going on, because I would disagree with you. I would, and we need to agree to disagree. Anyway, that's me. Thank you. I'll say, yeah, and I guess I'll come back and kind of end on the election theme. And I, and I guess I'm just, and, and it's sort of the signs, but I, you know, what a great time. I, you know, the past couple of years have been some elected official positions that have been unopposed. There is just a wealth of candidates that are running. There's lots of folks that are stepping up and saying they think they have something to contribute. Just encourage everybody to take the time, show the videos we just talked about of candidate night, get to know who the candidates are. We have some some passionate people that are running for offices this time around and, and get to know them and cast your vote. So with that, I'll say no more, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, this week I attended the uh, Scarborough Chamber of Commerce uh, meeting uh, at which they invited uh, uh, the town's representatives to present on Scarborough Downs, <coughs> uh, uh, which was done, and, and people who have an interest in this topic have seen the presentation and the information that uh, is being disseminated. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that the uh, Scarborough Chamber of Commerce, which is really a, a business-oriented representation of our community, voted unanimously to support the Scarborough Downs uh, TIF and credit enhancement agreement. Uh, uh, they think that it has a tremendous economic development uh, opportunity for the community. Uh, uh, I'll join the voices here that people need to vote. We have a bunch of terrific candidates. Uh, we are planning to have uh, our information table there where we are taking a, we have two, um, laptops so that you can take a quick survey on uh, w how the town ought to address the marijuana issue that is now squarely before us as to whether 
we shall or shall not, or where shall we allow uh, uh, marijuana testing, manufacturing, growing, uh, uh, and retail sales. Uh, and so uh, it's important for people to take the opportunity to tell us uh, how they feel about that. The same with the Scarborough Downs. The materials that uh, we are uh, having available to people at the table uh, uh, for voters who are coming through gives uh, the contact information so that you can reach out and say, here's how I feel about it. And all seven councillors uh, and the town manager simultaneously hear your voice. Uh, and we have been uh, not only putting a lot of effort into uh, presenting this information in public sessions, but we want to hear back. <clears throat> uh, and we have heard from a limited number of people, but we all reach out and talk to uh, constituents. Uh, and so I think we are getting uh, an idea, but sometime uh, after the November 7th public hearing, we will schedule this for, uh, for further action. Uh, and it's going to be guided in large part by how the community feels about it. So take the opportunity to let us know how you do feel. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, um, sorry, Councilor. With your, yes, I am. Um, I just wanted to ask through you, if I could ask, um, Tody, would you mind reminding people about when voting is available? I had, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this, I had a couple people reach out to me who are totally awfully misinformed on when absentee voting ends sure. and when registration is available and whatever. They're getting confused by stuff they're hearing. So. Sure. As of today, in order to register to vote, you have to register in person. Um, you can vote by absentee without any reason up until November 1st, and then the fall of that Friday and Monday you have to have a specific circumstance in order to vote by absentee. And you can register as of day of election, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. And they can call on the phone and request a ballot, and we can mail it to them as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So the town, it's wonderful that the town takes every, makes every effort to be able to allow everyone to vote. Uh, and we have a lot of important issues that I think we all agree are before us. So with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Come on. Yeah. Satisfaction.